We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight, we're going to be sharing a list of games that look like they're for kids, but they are not. So this is something I don't remember noticing until, I don't know, last three years, maybe last five years. I, I didn't double check the list to see when the first one of these came out, but it just seems to be happening more and more often where a game comes out with a license or a look or an art style or a packaging type that just screams, this is a game for kids. This is a mass market game your kids will love. And then you get the game home and you go to play it and you're like, whoa, this, there, there is no way my kids are going to grasp this. Now, I'm not supposed to say my kids, my kids. I mean, like kids in general, the average sixth grader is not going to grab grasp this game or the average six year old is not going to get this game, depending on how it looks. As always, whenever we talk about kids games, we have to generalize to some degree. Every child is going to be different and process things in different ways and uh, mm -hmm. be, you know, be more or less mature based on a million different factors. Yes. Uh, so we are only able to look at general friends. Yeah, it is likely that some people's kids can play all these games. That, that is, I'm not saying that's not possible. And I'm sure at a certain age, all kids could play all these games when they get a certain experience level. But what I mean is like the difference between a kid's game and an adult game in, you know, is it roll and mood? Is it simple? Can you play it in a short period of time? Does it have a short attention span? Versus I have 87 options on my term and I don't know what to do, right? Like that's kind of the scale we're looking at here. We're looking at kids games versus gamers games, like hobby yes. board games. Hobby board games where these are, these are look like they're marketed for kids, but are definitely higher. And I, I just, for one, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why is this happening? Like I said, to me, it seems like a new trend. I, someone proved me wrong. That's fine. Maybe this has always been happening, but I don't remember ever getting a game as a kid and being like, whoa, this is way too complicated. Or if I did, it was like, it really wasn't all that complicated. I'm, I can't think of an example, but uh, off the top of my head, like so, something like Thunder Road probably would have been considered complicated, right? Compared to other games that were out or um, another one I had, um, I'm forgetting the name, Secret Mission was a little complicated compared to other ones, but like it was nothing compared to, I don't know, Advanced Squad Leader or something my dad was playing or even a choir. I think what's happening in a lot of cases is we have grown up with many of these licenses. A lot of these licenses have existed for 20, 30, 40 or more years. And so we associated with them as kids and perhaps we grew out of them. Perhaps we didn't. Some people, some people haven't. Mm. Uh, and, and so we still have that, that association in our mind with kids where there are a lot of people who still embrace and enjoy a lot of those more youthful IPs as adults right. uh, mm -hmm. and are looking for the feel of that IP that they know and love from their childhood, but they don't want Candyland. They want something with weight True. and, and that may be what's going on. Um, what's, what's not clear, however, is the best way to indicate this to the pop, the populace yes. in general. Uh, how do you stop the parent from going to Target and buying the My Little Pony deck building game for their six year old kid, eight year old yeah. girl, uh, eight year old little girl who loves My Little Ponies or boy who loves My Little Ponies? Um, because they're going to get a shock when they crack that game. Yeah. Now, another aspect of it, too, I think, is is geeky gamers growing up to be geeky adults. Not only that they're still into the stuff, but that they want to share it with the next generation. So I think there's an aspect of that as well. It's just, it's more socially acceptable to be a geek and to be into pop culture things, especially childlike things like cartoons. Because a lot of the games we're going to mention tonight are based on cartoons specifically. Yeah. And a lot of it is the way pop culture has expanded. Uh, I mean, you know, there is more acceptance with an adult being into what used to be considered for kids only. Right. Mm -hmm. If if an adult wants to go to uh, My Little Pony Con, uh, you know, see bronies for uh, Ellos, that's OK now. I mean, yes, there are some people who are going to shun them, but we shun them. So that's fine. Uh, it's going to be OK for adults to go see the new, the new Disney movie yeah. for adults to go see the My Little Pony movie and things like that. And again, these people are marketable, are marketable, <laughs> too. And so sure. they're going to get products sold to them. Yeah. The other thought I had, too, was was our games just getting heavier? 
are, are just board games in general. Like the, the rise of hobby board games has had people expect more of their games. And has it gone too far? Like, yes, Candyland is kind of a joke. It's it's a predetermined game. At the start of the game, you shuffle the deck. You could figure out who's going to win. And, and it's there. It's a great learning experience, learning counting and cooperating and taking turns and all those other things you can learn from board games. But there, in my opinion, there's better games to teach those things. But like, I, and then they're like, did they jump too far? They moved too far away from Candyland because they're like, to me, I play a lot of heavy games. And I got to say, these games do seem pretty simple to me compared to some other games. But it doesn't make them necessarily simple for someone who's new to the hobby or who doesn't know these standard mechanics. And I'm wondering if it's it's a mistake of of designers thinking their games are simpler than they are. Well, I think what we are seeing, however, though, is that many of these games do have age limits that are respectful of the content yeah, of the true. of the weight of the game. The problem is the look, and it, it's mm-hmm. that it's that box uh that that view on the shelf. When, when the mom walks by Target and sees the My Little Pony, the fact that it says 14 plus isn't going to register oh. over the pony branding or yeah. the Disney branding or, you know, Smurfs or what have you. Um, that, that box is going to sell itself as something for someone younger. And even if, even if it says otherwise, you know, the op can say, well, it says 14 plus on the box all they want. But they put a bunch of cartoons on it that little girls want to stare at, and little, well, little girls, little boys, whoever, young kids adore. As we <laughs> as we can talk, we'll talk about uh, at one point. And and to be fair though, there's also that whole thing where pretty much most people who've been around hobby board gaming for a while know that game companies put 14 plus on the box because they can then avoid safety testing, and it actually has nothing to do with the actual ages that can play the game. How many times have we done a review? We're like, yeah, recommended age is this, but like my oldest can play it. My youngest can play it. We started playing when she was six. Like it's almost every review we've said, yeah, younger people could play it unless it's a content thing. Certain games like Sorcerer are definitely not kids games for a totally different reason than the complexity of them. And it, trying to explain Tante Coro to your kids may be an interesting conversation <laughs> you don't necessarily want to have at the game table. Or it might. You know what? Oh, <laughs> that might be the way to have that conversation Indeed. probably fair uh but i mean much like you have had experiences with uh my little pony i have had to you know warn parents away from disney smash up edition or smash up uh, disney mm-hmm. edition because they thought oh disney game and i thought and i went no i'm sorry but your your lovely family yes. is not the one to pick this up right now yeah. <laughs> Even if I were to sit there and, and handhold your entire family through the game, this would be a struggling yeah. experience for everyone. Well, we've already mentioned a couple games, but I do want to bring up one more thing first. Is this a good or a bad thing? Is it good that that like I don't know? Is it it's it, I it, it's to me it's bad that there's no indication that you don't know besides that fourteen plus. But is it a good thing that we're marketing all these kids things to adults and then adults are enjoying them? I have no problem with that. To each their own. If you grew up loving My Little Pony and you want to play a My Little Pony power game, all the power to you. And the game should be judged on its merits. Is it a good game? Is it enjoyable? Does it have replayability? Do you want to play it again? To me, more so than its theme. Yes, theme matters. We've had many conversations about how theme actually does matter to enjoyment of the game. But in many cases, with these kind of themes, I'm like, I can take it or leave it. I have a passing interest in or, or casual knowledge of the thing. Let's dive in. So I don't think it's a bad thing that there are kiddie looking games for adults. Yeah, unfortunately, again, it, it's it's like what I was saying, if if that mom is going to see it in the shelf on Target and buy it for their little kid, disappointment will be, you know, spread out <laughs> for everyone. There yeah. will be buyer's remorse and that's bad. Uh, so what we need to come up with is some form of of way of you know way of telling people we want people to buy these yeah we want people to enjoy them but we want the right people to buy and enjoy them Mm -hmm. we don't want mom to buy this for their six-year-old because it's the wrong i think there's being hobby board gamers i think in some cases you're like well i know that publisher that publisher doesn't do kids games and i think that's the case with one of our games tonight the problem is as games become more mainstream only hobby gamers know who publishes your games. The average gamer has no flipping clue. Even the average gamer you meet at hobby game nights 
probably has no clue. It's the alpha gamers and the people on Board Game Geek and the people who have gaming podcasts and the people who listen to gaming podcasts that tend to know that Renegade Games is not a company that does kids games. And there's also um, a variety, like, for instance, uh, you know, if if the fa- you've got a family and dad is a gamer and dad is the one who buys all the games and dad asks mom to go out and buy My Little Pony's Adventures in a Quest- Tales of Equestria, the RPG game. And they go out to the store and they buy My Little Pony's Adventures in Equestria, the deck building game. Well, there's a huge disconnect between those mm-hmm. two products. Yeah. And there's no easy way to tell because they both have official MLP art right there on the box. And Deanna's got a good point here. So it's bad because folks are going to buy that game, give it to a young kid, and then have a disappointing experience all around on all sides. That might even sour someone off board games in general. And I agree. You definitely could. Like I, the, some of the games we're going to mention tonight, if those were the first board games you bought your kid and haven't been playing a lot since like Monopoly and Candyland, you probably aren't going to buy any more. Yep. All right. Well, I think as usual, we're going to move on to our list. And as usual, this list is in no particular order. Well, we're going to start with the one we've already brought up a couple times here, which is My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game. That is the full name, I think. I don't big think title. I missed any parts of that. <laughs> big, big, big name. Big name, big name. This is a deck building game with some board game elements that has six different resources to manage. It's got you moving around on maps. It's got you facing various different hazards. It plays up to four players. It has a variable market, like all of that stuff. When you see this box, all the average person who doesn't know who Renegade Games is and doesn't necessarily know what deck building means sees My Little Pony card game. Great. I want to pick this up. This looks like a My Little Pony card game. I love My Little Pony. This is so much more than a mass market card game. Not only that, it's a fully featured done uh, like deck building game, like as complicated as any of the modern ones. This isn't even just Dominion level of deck building. This is a step above that. Yeah, no, this is this is a real game, <laughs> for lack of a, a better term. Uh, I know when I first when we first saw this, when we were going to crack the box the first time, I spent a while joking about it because I, it, it looks like the My Little Pony yep. content. It's very cartoony. The same art from the uh, the cartoon is used in the game. Mm-hmm. And out of the blue, you know, we started playing this game and I ate my words yeah. because it was a real deck building game that was more complex than a lot of the deck building games in my collection and other where and I, that i've played and please we are not trying to say these games are better than mass market games it's a, it, by saying real game that's not the right way to word it just it is a, a hobby gamers hobby. game a designer's game a, a heavier game a hobby game versus mass market yeah so that's that's a big one. And for more information on this one, just stay tuned. We are going to be doing a detailed review of the My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game later this episode, where you'll get to hear just how complicated this is and, and learn for yourself just that, like, there's no way that a young kid could play this. Some kids, sure. But your average My Little Pony little kid that watches it, you know, on Netflix or whatever, probably isn't going to grab this one. And this is big enough that even light gamer parents would have difficulty teaching. And that was My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria, the deck building game. Next, we have Disney Sorcerer's Arena, which I will say is much lighter than My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria, but still is not a light game in any way. This is literally a skirmish war game. This is Warhammer Underworlds. This is unmatched with Disney characters. This is a... A two player sit against each other, build your team, battle it out card game that just happens to have Disney and Pixar characters. And this one is also uh, confusing because it's quite possible that your kids may have played on their own or your device the Disney Sorcerer's Arena mobile game, which Mm -hmm. is not as complex. Uh, And there's a whole lot of automated things. You can do auto fighting and things in the mobile game. Uh, And, and, you know, there's no movement to take into place. There's no. Yeah, uh, characters dying and coming back, and there's a lot more to this game than the mobile version, which may not be clear. And the mobile version just actually started advertising the board game version, right. and it will be interesting to see what comes of that. 
Now, I will say again, this is a solid game. This is an enjoyable game. But my worry here is someone's going to see either that Sorcerer's Arena name, think, oh, the app, my kid loves the app. Or they're going to just see Disney and Pixar and think, oh, you get to play Sn Snitch and S Sully. And, oh, you, they've got cool little, they call them collectible. I don't know why they're called collectible, but collectible standees where you're battling each other. And then you're expecting to, like, roll some dice and stuff. But instead, it's a hand management um, deck construction game, deck smash up. Yeah, it's not deck construction. It's pick your forces. You use these cards to do all these things. And you're taking multiple actions, tons of decision points. Tons of powers to track, ways to level up your character. It's just not the light kids game. Now, I will call out one thing about this one, though. The rules in Disney Sorcerer's Arena are presented in four chapters. If you stick to just chapter one, you have a kids game. You're stuck with playing the same four fight characters over and over. If you play just up to chapter two, you still have, I'd say, a grade schoolers game. You can play the game at that level and still enjoy it and buy all the expansions. So props to the op for making the game playable by young kids, but you're not getting the full experience. There's a whole lot of game missing if you only play chapters one and two. It's a game and it's certainly it's more than a Candyland game by far. Uh, and there's definitely some enjoyment to be had, but there's so much more once you get into chapters three and four. Yes. Next up, we have The Ghosts Betwixt. This one, it's the premise and the artwork. Now, I wouldn't think this one would look like it's for younger kids because it's got a kind of horror theme to it, but it looks like Scooby-Doo. Like, uh, I think there's a very intentional Scooby-Doo look to this game. You are playing a family that's in the haunted heartland of America going by a haunted theme park when one of your kids gets abducted. So right there, you start to see that there's there's some some context issues that are are a bit much for little kids. Um, it gets worse as the game goes on, as that child is later tortured. Um, the big thing, though, well, I guess that's probably the big thing. The other thing, though, is that this is an almost Gloomhaven level of complexity dungeon crawler, all about maximizing your equipment, rolling various different types of customized dice synergies between your powers, exploration phases mixed with combat phases, semi-complicated AI um, movement for the monsters and everything. This is one that, yes, I could see playing it with kids, but I would say teens. And in my opinion, once you get the teen, you're not talking kids anymore. You're talking teens. Yeah, no, the this one was was bizarre because not only... Is it uh, very light uh, and very friendly and, and almost welcoming box art? Uh, it's inclusive with a uh, uh, one of the children in a wheelchair. It's very mm -hmm. friendly, and yes, there is a horror theme to it, and it's you know ghosts right there in the title. But at the same time, the art has get really softened the feel. So it's you know yeah, Scooby Doo level of horror, not. Uh, not, That's what you expect. You know, not yeah. monsters coming out and long, into, in, deep, in-depth in depth combat with line of sight rules and facing rules. And mm -hmm. uh, this game was really daunting, uh, even for me, because I haven't gone through, I haven't played Gloomhaven and I haven't played uh, a lot of the tabletop uh, miniature style dungeon crawl games. And that's what this was. I mean, it was yeah. absolutely a full on tabletop dungeon crawl for. Mm -hmm as an advanced to experienced player. Yeah. And then Deanna pointed out something good here is also it was hard. It was really hard. It is probably the co-op game we failed at the most often. So that was uh, the ghosts betwixt. Next, we're back to Disney, which are, you're going to see a trend here with Disney sidekicks. This is the one that baffled me the most and kind of inspired this entire episode. I've been thinking about this type of thing. Um, oh, one of the things I should have called out, we have reviewed every game we are going to mention tonight. So please check out my reviews to find out why these games are as complicated as they are. Plus, if you'd enjoy them as an adult, I probably should have called that out at the very beginning. We'll be sure to toss in links to each of those reviews in the show notes. So Disney Sidekicks got the game. From the op, and I'm like, eh, I guess we'll see if it's cute. If nothing else, the miniatures are cool. And then we sat down to play it and got our butts kicked. And then we played again and got our butts kicked again. 
Then we went online and found out the rule book's not very clear and they've released a new rule book and PDF. So right there, the fact that you need to go online to download the FAQ and the new rule book already drops it out of your kids aren't going to do that range. Yeah. Anytime. Then we got the proper rules and played and lost before every player even got a turn. This game is ridiculously difficult for no good reason. It's a Disney game where you play the sidekicks who are trying to save their heroes. What a great theme. That is a fantastic theme. Even not as a, I'm not a big Disney fan, but this was cool. I got to play Apu to try to save Aladdin. And you get to play the three little, uh, st- the godparents, the god fairies who are trying to, you know, save the character. You get to play, you get to play the cubs trying to uh, save Scar. Like, I don't know. It was just, or no, Scar's one of the bad guys. I, I can't remember. You play, uh, you play someone from Lion King. I don't even remember now. Whoever the sidekick was in Lion King, I'm drawing a complete blank on Pumbaa? who that is, right? Pumbaa? Oh, Timon and Pumbaa. Pumbaa. Yes. Pumbaa. You, you play, I, I can't remember if it's both. It's one of them. But like, it was just, just such a great concept and it is ridiculously hard. This is one the designer has gone on record to apologize for because not only that, it's the op and the op is a mass market publisher. This is a game that was in, to- well, Toys R Us when it existed in the States, but Target, Toys R Us, Walmart. It screams, it says, kick it into hero mode. Everything about this game screams kids game. And, and it's, it's not. And it's by the designer of Blood Rage, Cthulhu Death May Die, Rising Sun, Chaos in the Old World. It shouldn't be for kids. It's still listed as an 8 plus game, uh, despite the fact that the community strongly disagrees with that. Yeah. Uh, the, the box is, is 8 plus, uh, 2 to 4 players. And and absolutely everything about this game, including the setup, like the way it looks on the table, mm-hmm. the board, all of it. The is colorful just, plastic minis. Yeah. This this game screams kids game. And maybe not maybe not six, but eight, eight or ten, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, this is this is a pretty daunting game for any eight or ten for most eight or ten year old uh, children. And the biggest complaints I've seen about this one online are parents who picked it up and the parents can't figure it out to teach their kids. They're like, this looks like a game my kid can play. And I will admit this is a game you can play with your kids if you coach them, but you have to be able to understand the rules. And you have to be a hobby gamer to grasp this. I mean, Eric's fantastic friend of the show, great designer, but stepped maybe outside of his lane a little bit here, trying to go for kids and, and, and wasn't able to bring that, difficulty and and ease of understanding down as much and, and it's interesting to, to see eric talk now that nowadays yeah he a, sit, switched into that channel he's now. moved down into a you know keep it four pages make it easy make it easy to understand bring it down and, and it, that's the direction he's gone in but if this was the pivot point and i can't say for sure that it was yeah. but it seems around the it right does time seem um uh he didn't didn't quite manage it on this one. And as Mo yeah. said, there has been an apology issued. So yeah. that was, so th- yeah. This is the one that I almost like think they need to like take off the shelves and put a sticker on it. <laughs> like of all of these, this is the, the, the biggest gap between what you expect from the game to the actual gameplay. Although you said this was off. This is not off. I'm pretty sure it is. Interesting. Cause it's only the only publisher listed is spin master. Oh, maybe it's, did we get it from Spin Master? I may be wrong. I could have sworn it was the up. I, I thought so too, but as I'm looking, I'm like the only listed publisher. It's not like a list oh, of all I guess the we got that one from Spin Master. So. I, I should check my own review. Let's see. What does my <laughs> review say? Oopsie. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, so, Spin Master. Why did I think it was the op? It really does the feel op like an op so box. Many- the op, the op uh, design, it, it, it feels like an op game. It really does. Oh, apologies, the op. <laughs> My bad. Okay, Spin Master is even more mass market than the op. Spin Master is a kid's board game publisher. Right. They're, they're, they're like in every toy store. Spin Master is like one of the big kid's game publishers. Although, would you so want to teach Santorini to a kid? I mean. Santorini's, <laughs> yes, I could teach Santorini. You can Marvel, leave the God powers out. Marvel United. I've heard that's a kid's game. Haven't played it. Okay. There we go. At, again, at the basic level, Santorini, yeah. It's Santorini is an abstract strategy. Move, place, building. You can play that at six. You probably wouldn't play well, but you can play it at six. Connect four is Spin Master. See? That, <laughs> no, that's what I mean. They're one of the big publishers. Shoots, like a, shoots and ladders. Boom, boom, balloon. Yeah, they are definitely kids. Yeah. So but, they said in a way that's almost worse. So that was Disney Sidekicks. 
definitely not your little kid's game. All right, this this next one's borderline. Um, it mainly ended up on the list because my list seemed a little short, and I was looking for some stuff to add to it. And that is Scooby Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. This is a Coded Chronicles game from the Bamboozle Brothers. Uh, this one uh, now it makes me question. I'm pretty sure is the op. <laughs> I'm second guessing everything now. Yes, it, it, I'm. Per, it, it, it's the op. Um, this one older-ish kids, but not young kids. But this is very much Scooby Doo the game. You are solving a murder mystery. You are going through a haunted mansion, and it is a fantastic family game. It is a great game for the whole family, but I don't think it's a game kids would play on their own. This is something for playing it with kids, but there is a lot of reading. There's a lot of fiddly bits, and then there's some weird things you have to do with numbers to get what you need to look up that I think younger kids are going to have a hard, hard time with. I think this is a great game to play with kids. And again, this one has, it's the Scooby-Doo art. It's the cartoon art, but it's 12 plus. This yeah. isn't a little kids game, but again, it little kids, like little kids are, are, you know, looking at that cartoon. They're looking at these characters. They know, and the very, uh, uh, the very, you know, friendly kid, friendly graphics on the box. And you know, there, there's definitely some uh, potential for confusion. Even like the back of the box just has that kids game look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it definitely it's I mean, it, and it's clear it's on the front and the back. It says 12 plus they, they didn't. They're not they're not hiding anything. Yep. But again, with the graphics, it's understandable if some parent, you know, if their eight year old kid loves Scooby Doo. I could see this getting purchased and the mm -hmm. parent is in for a lot more playing of this game than they thought they were. They yes. thought they could hand it to their kids and no, they can't. They're going to be playing it with their kids. So I hope they like yeah. Scooby-Doo as well. Now, again, that said, we reviewed this one. We love it. This was one of the best experiences I had playing games with kids. It is a fantastic game for families to play together. Absolutely. This doesn't stand on its own as a kid's game. Plus, it's not replayable. Who wants to give their kid a game that you can only play once? It's Christmas morning. Here's your game. Yay, we played it Christmas night. Now it's done. Put it away. It's not a very good toy. <laughs> Absolutely. But that was Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, a Coded Chronicles game. Yes. Yeah. These games, maybe that's the secret. If the games have long titles, <laughs> not that, that's where kids. the problem lies. Because yeah. technically it's Disney sidekicks kick it into hero mode. I don't think Ghost Betwixt had a no had, had, has has anything that goes with it. Maybe it does. Um, next we have Smash Up Disney Edition. Though technically, I think all versions of Smash Up applies as well to a point, but Disney most so. When I got this, I thought I was getting a my first Smash Up. I thought this was going to be a kids entry level version of Smash Up to get people hooked at a young age and get them into the bigger world of Smash Up and hopefully send AEG lots of money. Then I got it, and I'm like, wow. So I personally hadn't played Smash Up since the first edition, kind of put it aside, hadn't really kept up, and I got this, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is complicated. There are way too many card interactions. There are too many things on these cards. There's too much to read. There's too much to remember. I got to remember what all these bases do. What's in my decks? I got to remember what's in the other deck over there, and then I got to remember what Deanna has in her deck, and... What, what, what counters? Oh, oh, in this, every turn, you have to put a counter on this. And every time someone moves, you can now use this ability. Like, it was just way too much. And what I find very ironic about this is we reviewed this game, and then the feedback we got from other players was actually that this is one of the most complicated Smash Up editions that's ever been published. So not only is it a complicated Disney game, it's actually complicated for Smash Up. Which is just like kind of blows my mind that if you were going to do a Disney version of the game and plus make a new gateway, here's your chance to kind of slow things down and simplify things to be that gateway. Yeah, I was blown away by this one because I'd never played any of the Smash Up. Uh, and again, Smash Up Disney, we, we, you know, OK, well, this isn't going to be an easy version. OK, we know that. So let's play this. And oh, this is difficult. And then talking with other Smash Up players, learning that, no, no, this is difficult 
in the range of smash up games yeah this is on the more difficult end of it and yet again you know i was at a public event and we had this out there and there were kids grabbing for this box going "Ooh, i want to play this i want to play this and just no I, I you know their immediate reaction was that one that we fear the one that you fear as a parent when the kid goes "Ooh, look at that i want that on the shelves of a store and and it's absolutely wrong for them and and, and i don't know i don't know a way to do it because it's not even as it's even less obviously a kid's game than several of the others on this list yes it, you know sitting on the shelf this isn't the most uh kid friendly box no but it's disney enough that if a kid sees it they're going to be interested yeah. if they are fans of disney and you know this is i'm not even sure what the age on it is but it's a really tough game yeah i, I was shocked and like I said, this also goes for the rest of Smash Up in a way, because Smash Up is all cute creatures. And, and like, yes, it has robots and skeletons, but even the art style is just kind of cartoony and light looking. And yeah, I want to mash up dinosaurs and ninjas, which sounds great to a 12 year old, which is probably about right. But it probably also sounds great to an eight year old. And the eight year old is going to have a hard time with this game. Yeah, it, it's listed as 12 plus. But honestly, even that seems yeah, that's, a little low. Well, 12 um, seems a little low. I, I would call this a 14 plus game because you need to be able to balance all those interactions and keep mm. it in your head. Uh, I guess what I would say is a 12 year old could play it, but it would take 14 to play it well. Yeah. Again, average. We're not trying to judge your kids. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, that just the, the number of interactions and math going on. There is a lot of math in this game. Yes. Um, and it's it's even though the new version has some tracking. Mm -hmm. You still need to do a lot of math in your head to be able to pull this off. Yep. And that was Smash Up Disney Edition. All right, my last board game for tonight is Tales from the Loop. Now, this one's interesting because I did not find this problem. To me, Tales from the Loop is not a kid's game, nor anything special to be about kids. My introduction to Tales from the Loop uh, was from a game convention where I played in the game and I knew it was a kids on bikes game, which is a style of role playing game and style, a genre of, of role playing that became quite popular. It wasn't until we published our review and I started to get comments and feedback and people direct messaging me that I realized that people thought this was a kids game, that because in the game you played kids in the 80s, that it was a game for kids. And that is very much not the case at all. So this was a case that, I again, I didn't realize people thought it was a kid's game. So for me, I'm like, great, it's Tales from the Loop. It's based on Simon Stylenhog. It's it's kind of dark, post-apocalyptic, dark mirror. You're, you're playing kids, but you're kids in the 80s, and specifically the 80s because you had the latchkey generation, right? The parents weren't there. The parents can't help, and the kids solve things. Well, people who heard that were thinking Goonies versus, I don't know what that, I, I don't even know what the adult non- kids version of Goonies would be Lost Boys, right? And the kids were thinking Goonies and the parents were thinking Goonies and not Lost Boys, I guess. And and I was actually shocked to learn this. And I'm like, I get it though. Like if I didn't know what Tales from the Loop was and I saw the advertising for the board game, there Deanna put it well, E.T. versus Stranger Things. Yes, I know some parents let your kids watch Stranger Things, but in general, Stranger Things is for adults, E.T. is for kids. Yeah, well, I mean, the the problem I think uh, comes from even just the genre kids on bikes yeah kids on bikes to those unaware seems like a child friendly or youth friendly uh concept uh the tv show was focused on dark. the kids it was dark it was dark. it was dark but it was still again it was still focused on the kids yeah. um and so playing as kids and i think there definitely seems to be somewhat of a disconnect where um a lot of adults don't necessarily want to play as kids or see playing as kids as childish enough yes. that if you're playing as kids, that's probably more of a kid's game or it's mm -hmm. for a bunch of people who want, who want to be childish, which is not the case here. This no, is not at all. This, this is very much advanced. Um, but uh, yeah, just the genre of kids on bikes, I think is deceptive in a way that we don't see because right. of our introduction and our, background knowledge oh, of the to concept. be fair when i first heard of kids on bikes 
I'm like, I had a lousy time in grade school and high school. I don't want to play that. I don't want to role play that. And I only gave it a shot because I trusted the DM. Right. And then I found out I loved it. It was absolutely fantastic. I loved reliving those days, especially with the little twist, right? The, the, what makes it interesting, the whole loop thing and everything that was going on. And I mean, to be fair, it's a 14 plus game. It's not aimed at kids, but you've got a fun little snowscape with two kids on the cover. Yeah. So it's, there's a little bit of mixed messaging there. Um, again, not to anyone who understands the genre or understands Stalin Hogg's work, but again, I, I my, my standard thing is, you know, parent walking down an aisle of target without any of this knowledge. That's the sort of the, the baseline I like to mm -hmm. think of is when that parent walks down an aisle of target shopping for Christmas, what are they seeing? And Tales from the Loop could potentially fall into that thing where, oh, let's buy this for the kids, yeah. which would be a horrible mistake. So in this case, it was never mass market sold. No. The problem is online stores. You Google, you know, kids games, games about kids, games for kids, Tales from the Loop will pop up in your search because kids on bikes. And they're like, oh, what's kids on bikes? What's a kids on bikes board game? And you'll get to it. And they, the thing is, people are buying it on Amazon. And the Amazon description doesn't say adult board game. You know, it's not spelled out. It just says play kids in an 80s that never was and solve mysteries and kind of sounds Scooby-Doo like. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, it's a real problem. And I don't I don't know. There was I mean, it's almost like there needs to be an RA, RIAA, MPAA sort of ranking system that you slap uh, on for board games. Not that I want that. It's, it's a horrible, it's a horrible thing to have agencies like that doing it. Although if it was done by someone like Gamma, who were board, yeah. you know, if, if self-regulating rather than an external uh, organization, it might work. But, you know, a, a stamp of guidance of some sort uh, the parents I don't know. And, right, you and, make that. I, th this is the part of the topic we don't get into is how to fix it. Cause I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know how to make it more clear. Like, I don't want to say stop using cartoony artwork when your game's about a cartoon. Like, no, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah, and even, even Disney smash up. Uh, if you re if you actually look closely at the box of Disney smash up, yes. Uh, Elsa on the cover looks mean, <laughs> for instance, you know, the, the art is, is slightly yeah. tinged. Uh, with the battle style of the game. And there is some of that in there, but the kids aren't noticing that. Um, the kids are, the kids are definitely sort of yeah. going to see the characters before they see that extra little something in their eyes that mm -hmm. shows they're out for blood. But this isn't just an issue we've seen with board games. It happens on the RPG side of the hobby as well as video games, but we're going to leave those digital ones for some other podcast to cover. So just because I think it fits really well, the first RPG I want to bring up is, well, Tales from the Loop for the exact same reasons as the board game. Now, I will say with the board, with the role playing game or the core rule book, which was the first thing out, no one's going to see that and think it's for kids. It is it is a thick tome hardcover. You're like, no, no, that's an adult role playing game. But the starter set does look very inviting and welcoming. And now I think it's the same thing, though. You're not going to pick this up off the shelf and be like, oh, that looks like a great game for my kids. But you're going to do some Google searching. You're going to search kids, games when you play kids, playing games with kids. You're going to do that. And you're going to stumble on the whole genre of kids on bikes. So it's not really specifically Tales from Loop. The kids on bikes role playing game obviously is also not kids on really brooms. for kids. You know, kids on bikes, kids, kids on, on brooms. brooms, you know, the, the whole genre uh, that emerged from kids on bikes is potentially problematic it in this is, way is, yeah potentially not child friendly so i don't need to dwell on it because it's really the same thing as the board game um which even ties in some of the same mechanics but same reason as the board game there's the tales from the loop rpg next we have one sean kind of mentioned earlier is the my little pony tales of equestria storytelling game the hardcover rulebook version not the later put out couple of years later starter set. Now the starter set is kid friendly. It's it's a which way book. You read someone reads through the which way book. Everyone makes decisions. You roll some dice. Tells you what page to go through. Yes, kids. But the hardcover rule book that I bought my daughter has her second RPG experience ended up being heavier than Savage Worlds with a very similar system where you have a dice pool system. You're rolling and you even want to roll four or better. 
and the bigger your skill is, the more dice you get, and you can bump your dice up sides, and there's a full bestiary you can buy as a separate book, which he owns. This is a full-on, as complicated as any core D&D rulebook, or again, Savage Worlds, it's very similar to. I own RPGs that are simpler than this that are mass market published. This isn't even like a simple mass market RPG. This is a full in game master required. Um, oh, I forget the term. Where basically the game boils down to you asking the DM if it works and possibly rolling dice to figure it out. I can't remember. There's a word for that style of play. It's that style of game. And I had no clue. The first time my daughter came down to run this game, she had her book with, I don't even know, 90 post-it notes in it so she wouldn't forget anything. And then she ran it and unfortunately fell into some DM troubles of ending up we weren't doing exactly what the module wanted us to do, so we were stuck in a loop. I, it's just that it, I, not at all what I expected. Now, I guess I should applaud River Horse for realizing that people were looking for a story like a, a kid's version since they did put out the starter set. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I got a little confused. I knew we had done a review and I didn't go back and read it. And I remember it. I remember some of the problems that your daughter had with it. But then when I when I Googled it today, most of what was coming up was this starter kit. And it was very yeah. obviously for kids with no GM. And the, the, the expansions were listing this starter set. And and so there was this confusion and what had happened obviously was that yes they realized that they had made a goof covered themselves and and turned it into a which way system with a real rpg on the back end for anyone who wanted mm -hmm. to go that far so good for them but again you could write, you could buy the wrong book here easily <laughs> yes the wrong book the wrong box all yeah. right next up I have Magical Kitties Save the Day. This one's from Atlas Games, and I agreed to review it. And while I will say, yes, it is simpler than My Little Pony Tales of Equestria, the storytelling game, this is not, not only not a kid's game, it's also not a good intro to RPGs. And to me, it's being marketed and sold as come play magical cats trying to help their humans which to me doesn't say come play a role-playing game, right? Like they're, they're marketing it to what I would think is supposed to be a new audience, new to role-playing games. Whereas, yes, kids can play this. My kids love it. Kids can easily play this. But someone in the room is going to have to run the game. And running that game is presented in a way that is for experienced game masters. I can't see a brand new person who's never been a game master before, never played an RPG before, even being able to run this game. It's instructions on how to run are just vague details and suggestions. The starter adventure is very much just a timeline. Here's all the stuff that's happening. Go. It is so not an entry level product. Yes, you could play it with kids, but there is no like if I gave this to my daughter, she'd just be lost. And and see, this is and this is very much a marketing problem. This one is on Atlas Games because the second line that they say in there at a glance, a role-playing game designed for all ages to enjoy that excels as an introduction to the hobby. Yeah, see, it doesn't though. And and if you have an experienced, capable GM, maybe that's true. But if everyone in the group, if everyone who's holding this package is new being introduced to the mm -hmm. hobby, there are going to be some problems. <laughs> no, I totally agree. And now the newest edition that's kickstarting is noir. What mm -hmm. kid knows what noir is? <laughs> I'm, I'm baffled by that one because, again, it seems to be not following what they were saying. If it was marketed like Tales from the Loop, it would make sense to me. This is an adult game about playing cats, saving your humans. And I got to say, the game's cool. The game's great. My kids loved it. They, they really liked it. The mechanics are simple enough for kids, but not like you need that adult. It's, it's, it's a family game. It's, it's, you, need, you need the 13-year-old that's read the book over a bunch of times and spent a week prepping before you play. Uh, and interestingly, not only do they have noir, but uh, like the Mars Colony an alien invasion book. No, no, that wasn't that was in the original box set. The noir is just being kickstarted now. It's a new printing of the game. It's a whole new box set. Oh, so you can just buy Kitty Noir on their website right now. Weird. As one, that's of, as one of the hometowns. Different then? As, as one of the hometowns. Oh no, coming oh, soon. Just, it's still just one of the hometowns, like Mars and all the others. Though. Well, it's I don't know. I didn't back the yeah. Kickstarter. Yeah, so, 
Maybe it's not oh. live now. Maybe it ended last week, which is why you can buy it already. Maybe. Uh, but yeah, so Magical Kitty Save the Day is definitely marketing itself in a, in a concerning manner uh, on this one. All right, my last game for the night, uh, before we're going to move on to some honorable mentions from the chats, because the chats called out some really good ones I'd like to talk about, mm -hmm. is Mermaid Adventures Revised. This one is the one that disappoints me personally the most. This one bothers me. So the first ever role-playing game I ran for my kids was Mermaid Adventures from Eloy La Santa, which was a standalone, small, soft cover book, fantastic D6 dice pool system, where they roll a bunch of white dice, they roll a bunch of black dice to show how difficult the task is. If they beat the black dice, they succeed. You get to add additional dice if something your character has in your character sheet applies to what you're doing. That's basically the whole system. Very colorful, lots of cool characters you can play, because there's not just mermaids, there's, uh, the, there's different folk. There's fish folk and octo folk and sea urchin folk, and they give you this whole world to play in and a bunch of sample adventures. It was fantastic. Is it? Still to this day, my favorite game to recommend for player parents to introduce their kids to role playing. Except you can't get it anymore. Eloy LaSanta went on to design the PIP system, which first appeared in Mermaid Adventures, but he refined it and decided to make it a universal role playing system. Again, kind of like a Savage World style. And put out the PIP system core book. But by the time PIP system core book came out, you're not looking at a kid's game anymore. You're using that same dice pool system, but you've got skills and talents and items and equipment and vehicles and powers and all the stuff you'd expect from a universal role-playing system that can handle anything from Western to sci-fi. Then he released Magical or uh, Mermaid Adventures. I don't know if it was just called Part 2 or what. Revised. And revised. So Magical Adventures, Re Mermaid Adventures, sorry, Mermaid Adventures Revised. And it's now just a source book for the PIP system game. It's no longer a standalone product, and it uses all the full complicated rules. It took a game that was perfect for kids and made it a game that adults could run for their kids. Yeah. No, absolutely. This one, this one, it was just a shame. Uh, it, they, they took something that was easy and loved and, and took it off the market, <laughs> took it away yeah. from uh, uh, making it unable for people to buy and replaced it with a system that may be a fine system, but it no longer fits that same niche in the market yeah. that was, you know, has a hole from this original book being removed. So some great comments here in the chat that we're going to talk to before we go into our lobby for any other edition. Uh, it, while we stay in the RPG, Math Guy Dave is mentioning the Marvel RPG. And this it could be a real problem. I mean, with the MCU being as popular as it is, there may be people interested. Now, I suspect probably not because this is going to be a big old hunk of a book. This is a chunky 350-page hardcover, $75, $80 RPG book. The uh, problem, though, is people are just going to see the cover on Amazon. Mm, that's, that's the thing. You got to think most people buy online now. And you're just going to see that picture. And you're going to be like, oh, a Marvel role-playing game. Yeah, I'm actually just going to, I want to take a look right now and see what the Marvel, what the Amazon listing for it looks like. Because um, yeah, that's, yeah. Like, I've yeah. seen it. Yep, I've, yep, I've shared yep. deals on it. And to me, that's where you're going to get you. I mean, it does say reading age 14 and up. But see, that's, a, that's an interesting that's thing. It's a different thing. Reading yeah. age does not, is not the same. So, interesting. Yeah, no, and they do only have the one, they only have the one. Uh, the one page or the one cover you can look in and you if you actually flip through and, and scroll yeah, through yeah. the look inside you're going to change your mind real fast but uh yeah but, but you, you gotta click know. through to do that you have to click through to do that and people don't click through so yeah the marvel role-playing game may be an issue so red meeple ryan calls out that the new avatar legends game um may have the same problem and i, I agree i don't know how complicated that system is actually yeah, my assumption is that it is not a kid's game its combat system is apparently quite complex yeah so yeah that's an example right there the new avatar because I, I don't avatar is such a weird one because i think most people when it first came out were teens that felt like that kind of they were it was it was more of a gateway to anime than it was a kid's cartoon but i can definitely still see it and one thing, another thing, Daft Guy Dave, and this is going on to sort of another section, is CCGs, collectible card games. True. Uh, 
And uh, Pokemon, for instance, sold to kids who have no idea how to play. And in the same realm, uh, launching this fall is going to be Disney Lorcana. Lorcana. Yeah, except except Pokemon kids can play. It's an easy enough game. Pokemon? I'd say that is a kid's game. Uh, and then the next one, of course, is this Lorcana. And we don't know for sure, but we know we it do know like that this isn't going to be a, a light game. They have said yeah. that this is not going to be for kids, but this is going to be Disney and possibly Pixar um, art. And I mean, yeah. it's going to have the same problem as Disney Smash Up and Sidekicks and all the other Disney properties we've talked about. But and it's specifically not a kids game. It is going to be aiming itself at the magic crowd. Yeah. So, yeah, this is this is leaning towards tournament play. This is organized play, tournament play, play for money, um, heavy competition. Looks interesting. Uh, but uh, so there you have eleven games plus a few honorable mentions from the chat there that seem to be marketed towards kids. It ended up not being for kids at all. Yeah. What did we miss? What games have you played and were surprised that they weren't actually for the people they seem to be marketed to? Leave a comment and let us know. Now, if you enjoyed this segment, we would love it if you dropped us a review on your podcatcher of choice. More reviews we get, they don't even have to be five star. The more attention we get by the platform and the more people who will potentially stumble onto our show. Also, if you've got a question for us, head to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop, or send me an email, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. 